so thankful that you're here. Just a couple of things to, to think about. Um, just want this, this to be the start of something big for you today. You know, so many times we just let these New Year's just roll in and we make a bunch of uh, resolutions that none of us ever keep. And so I'm not talking about resolutions today or anything like that. But I just want you, I hope this is a, a turning point for your life. That from today, your life will never be the same again. And uh, so we're just so glad you're here. Thank you for being here for that. Just a couple of things to, uh, to point your uh, attention to. Notice in your uh, worship guide there under the calendar time. Uh, of course, next week we will be commissioning uh, Faith Rising Community Church uh, out of this church. And then uh, they'll be uh, launching their first uh, uh, service on the 15th. But next week is our commissioning service, so you want to be here for that as we, uh, yeah, as we have all the Faith Rising folks here and we just pray over them and bless them. And uh, as you know, our goal is to, to be a church that plants churches. We don't want to be a mega church. We don't want to build our kingdom. We want to build the kingdom. And uh, so we want to be about planting churches. And we're three years old, and we have already been involved. Our, our goal is to be involved in a church plant every 18 months. This is our first one that we're actually hatching from here. But we've already been involved in four church plants already in 18 months. And so God's just blessing and honoring that. And then uh, also just uh, on the, the second week of January, a couple of things coming up on Thursday night, the 12th. Notice in there, we've got a great opportunity. We've got an opportunity to feed 225 hungry college students. And we need your help. We need your, your, your serving hands, your loving hands. The greatest thing about that is you get to walk around and serve and pour tea and just be a waiter or a waitress in Jesus' name to 225 college students. That is awesome. What a great opportunity for us. So we need your help for that. So please be marking your calendar for that. and We'll let you know more about that as we get closer. And then the birthday table is the next day, the 13th. But uh, uh, we've got uh, our uh, connection card in here. If you uh, haven't filled one of those out, I think it looks pretty much everybody's home folk today. But if you, if you need to give us some information change or your, your whatever, do that. And on the back, you can do prayer requests, serve interest, decisions that you make, or just questions that you have. And then also you'll see your generosity envelope in there. And uh, that being said, you know, we, we worship not just during an hour on Sunday morning, but we worship 24-7. We worship through uh, fellowship, through music, through friendship, through uh, Bible study, through teaching, uh, and we worship through our generosity. So right now, uh, let's prepare and continue to, to magnify that victorious God uh, through our generosity. So let's pray. God, we come to you now, Lord, and we just love the fact that uh, you're, you're a God who loves us. You made us. And God, you, you made us with a generous heart. You made us with a giving heart. And so God, let us understand that generosity is not just about money. It's about our lifestyle. So God, you know the needs of this church. You know the needs uh, of the people that we serve and the people that we minister to. Uh, you know the needs, our building needs. And God, we trust you explicitly as we worship you right now through generosity. In Jesus' name, amen. This year, this year. Oh, hello. I was wondering one if it's going to turn, up, turn the right way. I was going to have to read it upside down. Uh, well, let's flip the lights on. Let's uh, let's just have a little little living room talk today, can we? Let's just have a, let's just have a little family time. Back in uh, when I was growing up, if there was anything important, there were, there were four of us. First of all, I need to say there were four of us in my family. So if there's anything we had to have a family discussion, my dad called a meeting of the poorhouse foursome. So uh, so we're calling a meeting of the of the rich house. How many ever? Because we're rich in faith, aren't we? Rich in the blessings of God. Hope 2016 was a, yeah, well, it starts out, Hope is a year uh, of milestones for you. For some of you, it might have been. For some of you, it was a, a year um, of, of loss, of heartache, of different things. And, but I just want to assure you, God's got a new year in, in store. And uh, so let's just jump into this thing, can we? Back in, uh, I think it was 1994, 
I had the opportunity to go out to a leadership conference out in Colorado Springs, which in itself was pretty nice. <laughs> Stayed at the Broadmoor. Ooh, <laughs> I couldn't afford that. Somebody else paid for it. But uh, uh, stayed at the Broadmoor there. And there were about 500 youth ministers there. And one of the keynote speakers was a, a guy by the name of Dan Webster. Anybody ever heard of Dan Webster? A couple, couple of folks have. Okay. Dan Webster. Dan at that time was a big deal at Willow Creek Church in Chicago. Willow Creek at that time was probably one of the largest churches in the nation. had about 28,000 members. And Dan was in charge of a, of a youth ministry staff of about 100 what? <laughs> he had more staff than I had kids. But uh, anyway, he was one of my heroes. He really was one of my heroes in the faith. And we didn't know it at the time, didn't know it till afterwards, but he was at this huge church, huge name recognition, probably one of the foremost youth ministry experts in the world. But when he was speaking to us, he was really struggling and going through a time where God was calling him to take a leap of faith. I mean, a total leap of faith. That, you know, and you would think, why would you do that? You know, why would you leave such a, a wonderful position? Why would, you, why would you even think about that? Like I said, he didn't tip us off to this till, till later. But he was, he was wrestling with a decision that was literally going to change the trajectory of his life forever. Now, you know what trajectory is? Like, so it's when they shoot a rocket, and it has a trajectory, and it goes up toward its goal. Well, if you change that trajectory, it goes toward another goal, right? So if you're shooting a rocket to the moon, and you change the trajectory, it might go to Mars or somewhere, okay? So, but I just want you to know something, that, that his talk that night changed my life forever. My, my relational life, my spiritual life, everything about my life changed from that night on. Um, and so uh, Dan talked about celebrating our relationship with God. And this, this was perfect because it was the first week of January. And so it was perfect timing for stepping into a new year. And he also talked about a word, he said, I want us to think about what it would mean to have a truly receptive heart. Say receptive heart. Receptive heart. Okay. And so as we were going through stuff out here that I had stored away forever and ever and ever, I was throwing stuff away and sorting through boxes and stuff. I happened upon my notes that I took at his talk. And as I sat down in there on the floor, I just, I was just overwhelmed again. To think where, where God has taken me from 94 to today and how none of this is, is about Scott Carroll. It's all about God. It's all about what he's done. And I was just, I was just blown away. And, and that, those notes just reignited this passion in me. And, and it's just like it just, just tore me open again. So I'm just going to tell you, hang on because it's about to get real. It is. Uh, what you're hearing today is, it, I, I, all I thought was, it's like, it's like God was saying, this is what I want the church to hear. This is your New Year's Day sermon. I had something totally else planned, um, but this, you know, God said, this is what I want you to do. So I went back, I took my notes, and I, I re, rewrote today's sermon based on those notes. So what you're hearing today is an ad adaptation of my notes from that uh, Dan Webster talk. And... God renewed the, the, the desire in me to have a truly receptive heart in 2017. He said, Scott, starting on January 1, 2017, I want your heart to be truly receptive. And I thought, well, God, I thought I'd been pretty receptive. He's like, you ain't seen nothing yet. So uh, as, as we move into 2017, I, I want all of us to, to think, what does it mean? What, what does it literally mean for us? Not, not Sunday school answers, but literally mean for us to live our lives with a truly open, receptive heart to what God's calling you to do. And you do realize this. God's calling every one of you to something. He's not calling just pastors. You know, 
He's calling you to something. And he's wanting you to stand up and answer his call. That may not be go to Zimbabwe and be a missionary or something. That might just mean go share with the person at the cubicle next to you. Or go, go love that person that nobody else is loving. God's calling you to something, and so many of us are totally unreceptive to what, you know, it's kind of like, okay, God, yeah, that's good, okay, and then we go on about our business. I want, us to, I want us to think about what it would look like every day in 2017 to have the receptivity in our heart to if God says do this, you do it, and you don't even question it, even if it sounds stupid and foolish and is uncomfortable. You just do it. You just do it. So what does it mean? Not, not, just, not just contemplating it, not just thinking about it, not just studying about it. You know, too many times we use prayer as an excuse, don't we? I'll talk to people and I'll ask them about serving someone. They say, well, let me pray about it. You know what that means? The same thing as when your kids ask you if they can go to Target and get a toy and you go, we'll see. You know what that means. That means you ain't getting no toy. We ain't even going to Target. And when you say, I'll pray about it, most of the time you're saying, don't even talk to me anymore about this. Because I ain't even interested, okay? But if, if we're going to live in 2017 with a heart that is totally, and I mean totally ripped wide open to whatever God's calling us to do, wh- what does that look like? What if you were just to say, okay, God, in 2017, whatever. Just whatever. Just do it. Just do it. What does that, what does that look like? And I remember I found one of my notes, and Dan challenged us, and I had highlighted this over and over and over. over. And this is a question he asked right at the top. He said, if I'm sincerely, authentically going to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in and through me, then God, what do you want me to do? You realize that you are the instrument for God's kingdom coming to this earth as it is on heaven? You are it. Okay? If, if we're really going to pray that kind of gutsy prayer there, you know, what kind of predictions, what's it going to look like literally in our lives? Okay? And so before we get to those predictions that Dan talked about, there's a couple of... Couple of uh, filters that I, that I want us to, to go through this thing. Since I heard Dan in 1994, like I said, literally, my life changed from then. It's never been the same. And there's been a, there's been a growth in my under, understanding of my faith and my maturity in my faith. Okay, I'm not saying I'm, I'm all that in a bag of chips. I'm just saying... I've grown. I'm not the same guy that I was in 94, in here, you know, neither here. <laughs> but then I was 31 waist and that kind of stuff, but my leg is a 31 now. But so one of the things, one of the things that I have just focused on since then, and especially in the past five, five years or so, is I'm, I'm, trying to be less selective about what I read in this and read the whole thing. Okay, now I'm not talking about from cover to cover, okay? I, I want to know, I want to know what, if this is God's word and this is the truth of God's word, I want to know what he's saying to me. I want to know that, okay? And, you know, so, Sometimes it's really, and we're guilty of this. We all are. Preachers are especially guilty of this. Taking a verse totally out of context and making it say something you don't mean it to say. Or that God didn't mean it to say. You know, totally out of context. Um, so we can do that, and we can look at verses in there, and we can find verses that make me feel real good. You know? I can find verses that, oh, thank you, Jesus. You know? I can find them kind of verses. I can find verses that pretty much can justify about anything I want to do, quite frankly, you know. I mean, if you look in the Old Testament, if I want to sacrifice a child, I could, I could pick a verse out of there and sacrifice a young, and I've thought about it several times. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I want, listen, what I'm saying is, and I'm, I'm, tr- I'm just trying to be honest with you guys, okay. I want this book to make a difference in my life. 
I don't want to just read this book. I read John Grisham novels. Y'all know I'm a history nut. John Grisham, not history. But I totally devour history books. I mean, I just tear those things up. I don't read stuff a lot of times in one sitting. But you give me a, yeah, there's a book about uh, the Pacific War called uh, Flyboys. I sat down one day with a cup of coffee and read that whole, you read it down? I re read that whole book straight through. I don't, want to, I don't recommend you read it uh, because it, unless you really want to know some stuff. But I read it straight through. But you know what? Flyboys didn't make a difference in my life. Not a, not a bit of difference. You know, reading a notebook didn't make a bit of difference in Cindy's life. Well, maybe it did. She cried a lot. But, you know, what I'm saying, see what I'm saying? I, I want this book, God, to be in here. I want it to make a difference in my life. I want it to affect the way these feet walk. I want it to affect the way this tongue talks. So we can focus on all these blessing verses and all that kind of stuff, and we're real good about ignoring the responsibility verses and the suffering verses. Didn't Jesus say, if you're going to follow me, you better count the cost? He wasn't fooling. He wasn't fooling. So I guess what I'm saying is, since 94 and since Dan, well, I started to say since Dan Webster ruined my life, but I'm going to say since Jesus ruined my life. <laughs> Jesus will just wreck your life. If you follow him, he's just going to wreck it. You know? A good, it's a good wrecking, but he's going to wreck it. And so I, I want to have a greater integrity to what this book says and how it makes a difference in my life. And let me give you an example of that. Okay? Look with me in Hebrews. The Hall of Fame of Faith. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, as soon as you say Hebrews. Hebrews 11. Oh, that just jumps right out at you. You just kind of well up inside and, you know, faith is, is, oh, it's just awesome. Look at verse 32. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Samson Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. Now listen, oh, listen to this. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, received what God has promised them. Listen, shut the mouths of lion, quenched the flames of fire, escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back from the dead. Boom, I'm there. That's where I want to live right there. Dude, I want to be all about that section right there. You know, and, and that's where I would stop reading, right there. But guess what? There's this little semicolon right there. Look at the next verse in the next section. But, anytime God puts a big but in the Bible, you better look out. But, everybody say but. But others were tortured, <laughs> refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. Someone about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute, oppressed, and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over the deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. Guys, I used to really love that victory part, coming back from the dead and all that kind of thing. But I wasn't really, I wasn't really hip on getting sawed in half. You know, I didn't want to read that section. I didn't want to read that section about where I was destitute and where I was having to live in a cave. So I guess what, what I'm saying here is, as I grow in my faith, I'm trying to read past the semicolon. And I want you to do that too. I want you, let's just journey in 27 together, 2017 together. Let's do that, do that. So, so as we do that, first before we do anything else, we've got to look at this and we've got to hang in there and understand, okay, let's do that together. And then the, the, the second thing, and this has just been such such an eye-opener and such a true thing since 1994 is the longer I walk with Christ, and please understand, I'm not putting myself up on the pedestal. I'm, just, I'm sharing my heart with you. I'm sharing my life with you, okay? The longer I walk with Christ, the less those old 
uh, conventional ways of defining the Christian walk work for me. It's just different. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. And I don't know about you, and I don't, I don't know if this is your experience or not, but it's mine, especially in the past five years. God just keeps getting bigger and more mysterious and less controllable, and I don't like it. I liked God where I could keep him in, the, in, you know, where I wanted him. But he just keeps knocking over my apple carts, and I wish he'd quit. He just keeps busting. My whole paradigm of Christian behavior has just gone out the window. And I don't, even know, I, don't, I don't even know anymore. He keeps surprising me. He keeps upsetting me. He just keeps doing all that stuff. And so I think about, listen, I think about what if, ooh, that's, that's hard. What if we were really called to be followers of Christ and we were really receptive to that second half of that Ephesians 11 thing? Do you realize that Jesus didn't die to give you a better life? Give you a good book, hard book to read, but a good book. The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, a priest who was put in a concentration camp and died three days before it was um, set free. And the books he wrote are phenomenal. He's deep. I mean, it ain't something you can just sit there and just glance through. You got to, I, you know, I got to read them things three or four times, uh, just one sentence three or four times to get it. But I'm telling you, man, the cost of discipleship. Um, you know, what if, what if that's, what if he's calling us to that? What does that look like? You know, what if, what if God's calling us to get out, of, to to not be comfortable, to get out of our comfort zone, to lay our lives down, to hand that baton off to somebody else? And let them run it across the line. How would I feel? You know, I love watching the Olympics, uh, especially the Summer Olympics, and that um, the relays. And those poor American guys this past year, they just couldn't get it for nothing, could they? I mean, they they could put duct tape on that baton and still drop that thing. You know? They had a hard time passing the baton off. Listen, I'm going to tell you, a lot of preachers have a hard time passing the baton off. A lot of us have a hard time passing the baton off to our children. And so we, we need to think about that. What if it's about passing that baton off and let somebody else have the privilege of busting that tape with their chest? You know, what about that? God's, God's, I'm, I hope you hear me, guys. I, I'm just being real flat honest with you. We're sitting on my front porch talking and drinking sweet tea. Okay? So... What if, what if, and, and this is one of the things that Dan Webster just dropped this huge bomb on me, and you should see my notes around this next sentence. What if following Jesus is not about getting a better life? You know, we're just notorious about telling people, if you follow Jesus, everything's going to be great. That is a lie from the pit of hell. You're going to wake, when you become a Christ follower, you're going to wake up the next morning, you're still going to have wax in your ears, your nose is still going to run, you're still going to have bad breath. And some preachers make you think you're just going to be like, you know, Benaka forever. <laughs> no. Your life's going to stink. Your life's going to fall apart. People are going to hurt you. And even more when you're a Christ follower. Because Satan, you got when you become a Christ follower, you get this target on your back, and Satan just, you know, boom. So, so I think maybe since 1994, and then especially in the past five years, I'm, I, I've just quit following Jesus to get a better life. So, that being said. If, if this is what we want to do, if we want to have a truly open, receptive heart to what God wants to do in our lives and to who and what he's calling you to do in 2017, three predictions that Dan Webster made. And uh, luckily, uh, you know, I, I was able to become a good friend of his uh, after this, and, and we talked a good bit. And I had to tell him what I said, Dan, all three of those, all three of those predictions came true. All three of them did. Okay. 
Now, I'm not talking about Nostradamus predictions and all that stuff. I'm talking about real predictions that you can, you can take to the bank, okay? So, let's talk about his three predictions that he did. And I want you to, I want you to hear these because I think these predictions are going to affect your life. I want today to be your 1994, January 7th, 1994, at 7 p.m. at night. I want, I want for you, from this day forward, for nothing to be the same in your life anymore, spiritually. So what does this look like? What will it be? First of all, and this is true, we're going to end up, if you, if you have an open heart and you truly say, okay, God, in 2017, whatever, you just rock my world and I'm going to kick back and I'm going to accept it and I'm going to hang on to it, what's it going to be? First thing is this, you're going to end up in circumstances that you didn't count on. You know, sometimes, sometimes things start out bad and they get good in the end and then sometimes things start good at the beginning and then they turn out really bad. Turn with me to Jeremiah right quick. That's in kind of a little bit past the middle of your Bible. So go to Psalms and take a right. Here's a guy who in the beginning, things started out like gangbusters. I wanted, I, I'd love his gig. You know, man, I'd love his job when he, was, when he started. You know, here's a guy that things started out great. They were fantastic. Mm, they didn't end up so good. Okay. First of all, look at look at what God says, and this is a verse most of us know. Okay, but I'm gonna tell you what's the truth. This verse became more than just words to Jeremiah. This was what he clung to for his life. Look at verse five. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart, appointed you as my prophet to the nations. So God called Jeremiah, and, and God comes to him, and he tells him that. And guys, this is great news. Could you, how would you like to hear from God today? You get a text from God, and God says, Hey, I knew you before you were twinkling in your daddy's eye, and boy, have I got plans for you. Hang on. You'd be like, yay! Okay? It's like that excitement faith. God says, I've called you. I'm going to be with you. You're going to take ground for Christ. You're going to be making a difference in people's lives. Just go out there and get them. J go get them. And Jeremiah believes it. Boy, he jumps in there and takes off like a wildcat. He, start, he stands up. He, he says, whatever God tells him, he says it. And it don't matter who he says it to. If God says, tell that person, tell the king, he tells the king. He doesn't worry about the con. He didn't go, oh, what? What if? What if? He didn't say, what if? He says, okay. He says things to people. He speaks with power. He didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't make it politically correct. He just laid it out there. This is God's word. God told me so here. Booyah. That's it. So he's just busting and going. This is like Billy Graham in his ultimate, you know, his, his ultimate stride, man. Poo, 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 poo. And in the middle of this, in the middle of this faithful service, in the middle of this relentless preaching and stuff. We find Jeremiah later on, 20 chapters later, really having this honest moment like, whoa, I, it's, this ain't exactly what I thought about when I signed up for this, God. You know, it's like somebody signing up for, for Marine boot camp down at Paris Island thinking you're going to go over and eat at the, you know, the, um, what's the name of that restaurant we like? The Dockside, yeah. Like you're going to go eat the Dockside every night. No, somebody's going to try to kill you every day. And you have some guy hollering at you in the face, you know. But that's, that, you know, Jeremiah was like, ah, oh, great, I'm in this thing. And all of a sudden, 20, 20 chapters later, he's like, oh, dude, what have I got myself into? Or more importantly, he says, God, what have you got me into? So look what happens to Jeremiah here. It, it, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. And it, he's doing what God wants him to do. And here's the thing, listen, oh, listen. Whenever you're doing what God wants you to, you're going to tick somebody off. So just go ahead and get used to that. You're going to tick somebody off. He happens to tick off a priest. Oh, when you're doing something God wants you to do, you're going to tick off the preacher sometime. Because preachers, supposed to, they, they, they're going to tell you, oh, I'm the one God speaks to. You know, you can't do that. Uh -uh, you can't do that. That's what I ain't going to tell you. I'm going to tell you, you, you go, you do it. But So he, he ticked off the priest. Priest's name's Pasher. 
Okay, not passion, but pasture. And pasture tells him to shut up. Jeremiah says, ain't no way. So pasture says, watch this. Stripped him buck naked, put him in the stocks in the middle of the, in the, middle of the courtyard in the middle of town, and had some guy beat the daylights out of him. So here's, here's, here's Jeremiah, who's been the, the, the voice of God for 20 chapters, buck naked in the stocks, getting the daylight speed out of him. You ever been there? I feel like, wait a minute, I was doing what God told me to do, and all of a sudden I'm just getting the daylight speed out of me. I don't understand this. And he goes through all this disgrace and this humiliation, and... And then the greatest thing is, he sort of says to Pastor, he says, is that all you got? Hit me with your best shot. You know? He's just, he keeps talking even when he's naked, getting beat up. But then, then, right there, and this is what I want you to hear, there's this, this authentic moment of reflection where Jeremiah really says, okay, I was receptive to God, now what did it get me? Okay? Has it, has it led me where I thought it was going to lead me? Look at, uh, look at Jeremiah 20. Flip on over to Jeremiah 20. And this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Verse 7. The New Living Translation says this, and this is Jeremiah talking to God. Jeremiah says, Lord, you misled me, and I allowed myself to be misled. One of my other translations says, you tricked me, and I fell for it. You ever felt like that? God, you tricked me, and I fell for it. I have. But then look what he says. Let's keep reading on. Drop on down. Uh, well, let, let's keep going there. Um, God, you misled me, and I allowed myself to be misled. You were stronger than I am, and you overpowered me. Now I'm mocked every day. Everybody laughs at me. If you was naked in the stocks, bleeding from your nose, people be laughing at you too. When I speak... The words burst out, violence and destruction, I shout. So the messages from the Lord have made me a household joke. Guys, listen, when you follow Jesus with a total receptive heart, you're going to be the laughing stock of butt of many jokes. You just get ready for it. But now listen, this is where he really gets authentic. He says, but if I say I'll never mention the Lord or speak his name again, his word burns in my heart like a fire. It's like fire in my bones. I'm worn out trying to hold it in. I can't do it. He says, look, God, you tricked me and I fell for it. But if I try not to say your word, it's like a fire burning in me and I can't even hold it in. You said you were going to deliver me. I was naive enough to believe you. I surrendered my life to you at the beginning. You said I was going to be like a pillar of iron. You said I was going to be all this stuff. And now I'm getting the mud beat out of me. And I just picture Jeremiah going, God, excuse me, but that's a pretty strange definition of you know, deliverance. And he says, he says, this is not what I planned. He, Jeremiah's really saying, am I going to hang in here with this or not? And guys, listen, when you have an open, a receptive heart, you're going to face those times where you say, am, am I really going to hang in here with this? Because this is hard, and I didn't count on this. Okay? Drop on down to verse 11. But the Lord stands beside me like a great warrior. Before him, my persecutors will stumble. They cannot defeat me. They will fail and be thoroughly humiliated. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of heaven's armies, you test those who are righteous, and you examine the deepest thoughts and secrets. Let me see your vengeance against them, for I have committed my cause to you. Now listen to this. This is the guy who is naked in the stocks, and listen to what he says. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord. For though I was poor and needy, he rescued me from my oppressors. And then I love the next verse. He says, curse the day that I was born. And then he basically says, somebody shoot the guy that came and told my mom I was a boy. I just love those. That's, that's all thing. That's real stuff there, guys. That's just real stuff. 
So he's curled up in this little question mark, and he says, this is, this is not what I thought I was going to be into. So the point of this whole thing is, guys, you're going to end up in circumstances you didn't count on, and chances are they're not going to be real good circumstances. And your life's going to ball up in this little question mark. And this happens to every, the Bible's full of people like this. Full of people like that. Every, every time God shows up, he just seems to just, you know, turn people's lives over. You don't end up where you think you're going to end up. So the second thing Dan Webster predicted is this. If you get into circumstances that, uh, that you never planned on, you're going to reach points of surrender that you never anticipated. And guys, this has been a, this has been a thing for me right here. Points of surrender you never anticipated. I want you to think about John the Baptist. John the Baptist is really an unusual guy, to say the least. You realize that for 400 years, uh, John the Baptist, you know, the word of the Lord was, was quiet. John the Baptist was the key figure in, in Christian history before Jesus came. Okay? Weird dude, wore weird stuff, ate weird stuff, you know, smell, stunk, had a following. Go figure. But he's out there baptizing people and preaching. All of a sudden, this guy walks up, and John recognizes that it's Jesus. He baptizes Jesus, and Jesus' ministry, you know how it works. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And his ministry took off from then. He went into, now, speaking of end-up circumstances, you never count on, God initiates and commissions Jesus' ministry, and what's the first thing that happens? Forty days in the wilderness dealing with Satan. Uh-huh. You think that only happens to Jesus? Nope. Okay? So just get ready. Now, what happens here is, John. like I said, you've got to understand, John is the most significant person in Christian history at this point before Jesus comes up. And what's got to happen here is John's ministry has got to go down and Jesus' ministry has got to go up. John's role is to taper off and Jesus' role is to take off. Okay, that's what's got to happen here. So, and, and then we find this John, John 3. Look in John 3 here. Starting at verse 26. You know, John's got all these disciples and they're following him. And they're getting pretty, they're getting pretty jealous of this Jesus guy. People are starting to notice Jesus more than John, and they're getting pretty jealous of this. So they come to John, and they say, look. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, he's also baptizing people. And everybody's going to him instead of coming to us. I want you to let that settle a minute. Everybody's going to him instead of coming to us. Look what John says. No one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how I plainly told you that I am not the Messiah. I'm only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. When was the last time you were filled with joy for your competitor's success? This is the real stuff, guys. This is what I'm talking about. Let's quit playing with this book. When John got to this point, even though he was the, no, he was, he was the number one head honcho in, in Christianity at that time, he reached this point where he realized his circumstances were changing and he started to diminish and Jesus' importance started to go up. And so he basically says, look, don't look to me, look to him. Look to him. John says, I have what I have because heaven gave it to me. He's got what he has because heaven gave it to him. I told you from the beginning, I am not the Messiah. Listen, let me tell you, this goes for, for your preacher, for your, your parent, for your spouse or your significant other or whoever. If they try to tell you they're the Messiah, you run. Because preachers and other people have a notorious thing for wanting to be your Messiah. The church is the bride of Christ, 
not the prostitute of some man. And you need to hear that and you need to understand that. Don't you ever treat your pastor like a Messiah. Because this old boy is just like you. We're just working this thing together. We walk in this journey side by side, folks. John says, look, get off this competition thing. You realize that, and please don't hear me as downing, I'm not downing churches, but we, we needed a sponsor church. It took us almost 18 months to find a sponsor church. Do you know how many churches in this town who I was very good friends with their pastors told me these words? Well, we can't be your sponsor because our church will see that as competition. Guys, we're not here to compete with other churches. We're not. We're here to complete the kingdom. That's why we're here. Okay? So, so John says, look, get off this self-importance thing and let Jesus be the Messiah and you go follow him. Okay? So when you, when, when you get caught in these circumstances you don't plan on, you reach these, these moments where you say, look, now... Is the kingdom of God really about me or is it about God? Too many times it's all about us. You know, it's all about us. Is, is the kingdom of God taking what heaven has given me and being thankful to God if he gave somebody else more? John reaches a point here, literally. Now listen, John reaches a point where he says, I don't need to survive. If I've played my role, then it's about him. You reach this point of surrender where you want to push other people into the spotlight. It's not about us. It's not about you. It's not about me needing to survive unless God... Listen, it's not about protecting your space. It's not about protecting my space. You know, and, and this, is, this is something, this is the quote from Dan. He said, and, and this was, y'all don't even know where I was in 1994, but I was in this, this weird place and, and it was just this, yeah, this weird place. And John said, uh, I mean, uh, Dan said, look, maybe the best place you can get to is where you say, God, if you want to kill it all, if you want to end it all, that's cool because it's about you and not me. And that scared the daylights out of me because I'd been working all these years to build up the student ministry, you know. And I had to come to a point, and I got on my knees that night in the back of that, auto, in the back of that conference room thing, and I said that right there, and I wrote it in, in I wish I could find my Bible where, where I was taking notes because it would just be all tore up. But I got on my knees and said, God, if you want to kill it, then kill it because it's not me. It's you. It's you. But if you want me to continue, you let me know that it's you making it happen and not me. Because I want to do something so big that I can't do it, only you can do it. You know, we, we really just never get usable, I mean really usable, until we get to the point where we can really say, God, this is your ministry. If I'm done, I'm done. Okay? I'm going to serve you with a whole heart because I want it to be you and not me. And think about John. Where did John end up? Did he go out in a blaze of glory? No. He went out with his head chopped off. What about Jeremiah? How did he go out? Did he go out having fun? No, he got sawed in two. Guys, listen, and I'm just going to tell you. 1994 it happened, and, and five years ago it happened. I have never been more passionate about following Jesus Christ in my life than I am right now. And it's not about this church. It's about Scott Carroll and relationship with Jesus. I've never been more passionate about that. Never. So and when you get to those points of surrender, that's when God starts having the room to move around. And, and once you reach that, you're going to be drawn to an intimacy that you have never known before. It's in those moments of surrender that 
all it's about is your relationship with Jesus. It's not about your quiet time. It's not about your church attendance. It's not about how many mission trips you go on. It's about your relationship with Jesus. It's about knowing the fellowship of the suffering and the, the power of his resurrection. And, and forget this, this commitment mentality. We're, we're great about making commitments and just don't follow through with them, right? I told you before a thing about Cindy and I seeing a, a, a jewelry store in Dallas, Texas, and there was a sign in the window that said, We rent wedding rings. You talk about lack of commitment. You know. It's about, it's, it's about getting rid of the commitment mentality and choosing to surrender and follow Jesus moment by moment. Guys, you realize this is not a one-time shot where you just, okay, I'm following you, yay. It's every single day you got to do it. Every day. There's some things in my life where I have to crucify every day. I know Jesus took them to the cross, but you know what? The flesh in me wants to bring them back off the cross every day. I have to do that. Jesus said, if, you want to, if anybody take up his cross and, and follow me, he must take up his cross daily. One of, the, one of the gospels says daily, and I think that was written for me because I have to do that with some of my things. So you get to this intimate point. Intimacy, like Derwin used to say, intimacy, into me you see. That's intimacy. It's not a fast work. It's not something that snaps. It's this, this quiet inner thing where, where you're just, just contemplating. Okay? And it's this place in your soul that just overwhelms and just pours out. Okay? And, it, and there's stuff in you that God is birthing. I firmly believe that the reason I'm standing here today is because God made a way for me to go to Colorado Springs in 1994. I, 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 don't, I mean, I, I know that, beyond a shadow of a doubt. If I hadn't gone there, I wouldn't be here today. Where is your Colorado Springs? What's God calling you to that you don't even know? I was just going out there because it was Colorado Springs and Broadmoor, and I got three days skiing. And there's going to be a bunch of youth ministers out, and then they gave away a bunch of cool stuff. I come back with a backpack. Y'all know me. I love bags and backpacks. I came back with more backpacks and bags of books and everything. I was like <laughs> coming through the airport. You know, that's the reason I was going. And God says, ha, ha, fooled you. You thought you were getting books and bags, and y'all gave you a whole new life. I wrecked your life. It's about loving God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. In Him we live and move and have our being. That's what He wants, guys. It's in those, those moments where, where we just open ourselves and it changes everything about us. So what's the good news for 2017? The good news is this. Jesus is going to ruin your life. It's going to be a good ruining, though. He's going to ruin you from a life of the status quo. He's going to ruin a life of complacency, of self-importance. Uh, your heart's going to be transformed, and you're going to be more moldable and usable than you have ever imagined yourself before. You're going to find yourself in circumstances where you just scratch your head and you go, I don't know how I got here. And you're going to reach these points of surrender where you think, God, I just got to lie on you. That's all I can do. And then you're going to reach this intimacy and you're going to see God's work begin to work in and through you. And your life is never going to be the same again. Never. So, so where are you today? Where are you today? Maybe you're at one of those moments where, where you're like Jeremiah. You signed up to be a pillar of iron, and you're in the stocks naked getting the daylights beat out of you. Some of you here right there today. Maybe on the surface everything looks great in your life, but in your heart, you're just not doing too hot. Look, you're in good company. Jeremiah, of all people. Are you, are you at a turning point? And I'm not talking about, again, I'm not talking about New Year's resolutions. I'm talking about life. 
Are you at a turning point where God is, is singling you out to do some very amazing, important, significant things in you, and he wants you to become somebody who's usable? Listen, he just wants you to surrender your life to him. Surrender, uh, again, surrender, and this is a quote from Dan Webster that was just pretty powerful. Surrender is not about writing huge verbal checks with your mouth. That's commitment. Okay, Commitment is about writing huge checks with your mouth you never intend on cashing. Surrender is totally opening yourself. Totally opening yourself. And listen, it's not about saying, I'm going to do better. I'm going to be better. I'm going to read my Bible more. God says, that's great, but that's not what it's about. It's about your relationship with me. That's just a byproduct of it. That's how God talks to me. It's not about going and saying, I'm going to jump off towers. I'm going to go to Zimbabwe or whatever. It's, a, it's about, listen, your walk with Christ is about following him following him moment by moment and day by day. That's, that's what he wants, guys. Let's quit, let's quit this church mess. Let's just quit the church jump. And let's just fall in love with Jesus. I want to encourage you. I want you to pray about this. I want you to think about this, what we've talked about. And maybe some of you are saying, okay, God, that's where I want to live. I want to completely surrender to you. Okay, God, in 2017, whatever. And you hear the difference. It's not one of those whatever. It's I'm all in. I don't have any more cards in my deck. I ain't got none up my sleeve. They're all on the table. I ain't got nowhere else to go, God. God, honor my heart before you. And that's the challenge, guys, right there. And if you can live there in the next year, whatever, it's not going to be about strategy and trying harder and all this stuff. It's just going to be about totally relaxing in the intimacy and the surrender to Jesus. It's about people whose hearts are totally receptive. Jordan, y'all come on. Let's pray. God, I don't know what you're doing here. Well, yes, I do. 94, you just turned over my apple cart, and God, you did again three or four weeks ago out there in that building. God, I thank you for Dan Webster, Lord. I thank you for him having the courage, God. He has been such a... God, just such an example of pure, total surrender to you. I thank you for sending me to Colorado in 94. I thank you for sending me everywhere you've sent me to get me to today. And God, I thank you for people whose lives are going to be totally surrendered to you and they're going to live with pure, authentic, receptive hearts. And in 2017, starting today, they're going to say, okay, God, whatever, let's roll. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. Just a couple of things. Um, uh, first of all, um, I've, I've shared with you one of the uh, pivotal moments in my life was that 1994 conference, and uh, there were other stuff happening at the conference, but Dan Webster was the main thing. Uh, and I want to share another pivotal moment in my life, another one that I believe if, if I had not read this book, I would not be here. I'd still be at West End Baptist Church. I believe that with all of my heart. It's a book right here. 
by Mark Batterson. It's called In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. Crazy title, isn't it? One verse of scripture in the Bible talks about a guy named ben Hiah. And uh, I'm going to tell you, if I had not read this book, God, I would never have had the courage to step out and, and, and follow him as a missionary to South Rock Hill and then, then right here. Okay. Um, the elders and the staff are reading this book uh, starting uh, tomorrow. And uh, beginning next week, uh, Mark Batterson has written a follow-up book to that. This one came out about 10 years ago. This one just came out about 10 weeks ago. It's called Chase the Lion. And it says, if your dream doesn't scare you, it's too small. So we're going to be doing a five-week sermon series, uh, not teaching out of the book, but based on this book. And if you, wanna, if you want some good reading and some challenging, if you really want your apple cart knocked over, get both of these. I dare you. But uh, this one right here will rock your world. This one right here will rock your universe. But we're going to do a five-week series called Chase the Lion. And uh, I'm just real, real excited about that. And, uh, guys, I just sense, I just sense, I don't know what it is, but I just sense a movement of God's hand and a desire for God to settle down and put his favor on Outbreak Church. Other churches, but, I mean, I'm talking about us. Okay, God is wanting to do something radical through Outbreak Church. And it's our choice. I mean, we could sit here all day long and be a country club and just be fine and fat, you know. Or we could follow him and be totally surrendered. And so for, the, for today and the next five weeks, you just better hang on because we're just going to shuck it down to the cob and we're going to just get on this thing. Okay, bring somebody with you. It's going to be a life changer. I promise you it really will. Not because I'm speaking it, because I know the power of, of uh, Mark Batterson and, and his God has used him, and he's an amazing writer. You'll love both of these books. You'll love both of these books. But, uh, okay, that being said, I just want you to have an incredibly uh, great rest of your New Year's Day. Go eat you some collard greens and all that good stuff. You spent black, black-eyed peas, collard greens, and what else are we supposed to eat? Uh, something I'll eat anything it don't matter to me I don't, I don't care what day it is I'm gonna eat it I'm gonna go up the country I'm gonna, I'm gonna tear it up you know but that's right uh -huh. yeah barbecue I, I have been I, I found a barbecue place I didn't know existed yesterday it's on a little old back road in, in Florence so I told Jordan I said we're gonna make we're gonna make a field trip up yonder we're gonna check that place out uh, even uh, it, it smelled real good when I went by there yesterday but anyway uh, have just an amazing day think about what we talked about listen i understand trust me i understand um it took every ounce of courage i had to to call up dan webster at willow creek and say i need to talk to you because you don't mess me up dude i'm not a dan webster by any means but you got my digits you know you got my you got all my information if this has started something in you call me let's talk about it let's see what god's wanting to do because he's going to do something. So have a great day. Be contagious. You are sent.